Hello, BookTube. It's Thursday, and in some parts of BookTube, that means Poetry Thursday. That was something I did religiously for uh, last year, for a long time, uh, taking from this anthology, 20th Century American Poetry, which for me, the title was always a, also a term of condemnation. I thought, uh, and I still do think, <laughs> that the 20th Century American Poetry is where the whole genre went to die as a mainstream genre, as a thing that an ordinary person would read on the commuter rail from Scarsdale, as opposed to the ultimate gated community that hates outsiders and that outsiders hate. Uh, I found this big anthology and uh, really appreciated right away the, the scholarship involved here, the, the integumentary writing here, the opening chapter and the opening chapters to all the different sections is really, really good. Uh, I like that. I like the selection. So I thought, and it's chronological. So I thought we just we just beetle our way through the 20th century. We got all the way to the turn of the night to the turn of the 20th century, and then I stopped. Uh, and I stopped doing Poetry Thursday, but not everybody did. And and one of our newer channels, uh, Book Chat with Pat, also talks about poetry quite a bit on her channel and does readings that gives you really good, uh, knowledgeable thumbnails of the poet and the, the scope of their creative life and their achievements. Uh, and I was voxering with Book Chat with Pat and mentioned, yeah, that it, those are terrific videos. I used to do uh, Poetry Thursday, all just working my way through one problematic anthology in an attempt to renovate my own understanding and appreciation of 20th century American poetry. I used to do that, but I stopped. Uh, and she said, you should do it. You should start it up again. And I said, yeah, I'll think about it. And she said, you should start it up again, or I'll end you. <laughs> I swear, it's always the nice ones. <laughs> so, <laughs> with fear and trembling, I am going to start this again. And we're going to, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here. I'm not going to go to some other anthology. We're just going to do this anthology to the bitter end. Uh, picking up where we left off, which was the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, the so-called Harlem Renaissance. That's not what it was called at the time. But now it is called the Harlem Renaissance, and it's from the teens to the Great Depression. It has its own section in this book. So that's the next thing that we're doing is that section. It has, this book just, it endlessly impresses me with its critical apparatus. The the, the essays, the notes, it's all just first rate. Uh, so we are going to be dealing with today uh, Angelina Weld Grimke, who was the, the niece of the famous Grimke, Grimke sisters, the, the abolitionist sisters who have their own Penguin Classic volume and richly deserve it uh and she's an odd figure she she uh is one of the only people first of all they're one of the only people in this collection who never wrote a book <laughs> she she wrote prolifically for half of her life uh but they were bits and pieces that were sent to friends they were in various periodicals she was known as a writer as a poet as an essayist as a, a fiction writer but it, it never seemed to motivate her and then her beloved father uh, a, a really a totemic figure in her life as you can tell when you read the great biographies that have been written about her except that none of them have been uh we're back to that note right again uh when her father died in 1930 she just stopped basically just stopped uh, she certainly stopped writing and, and spent ye almost 30 years just to the to her death just living in an apartment just not, not doing anything. So it's a weird, fragmentary, literary existence. And when you read the poems, there are quite a few poems in here. I thought we'd read two. Uh, you want more. You wish there were more. Not just more in this anthology, but more that she wrote. You wonder what she would have written in her later years. And all, obviously I am tempted with the possibility that she did write all those years. What writer actually stops? I mean, I know we're all familiar with the example of Rambeau, who did actually stop writing. And just became, as he put it, another self. But what writer actually does that? How many of them actually do that? When she was pottering around in that in that place of hers in New York for 25 years, did she write? And, and is it somewhere? Who knows? A lot of what she wrote when she was writing, stories, polemics, editorials, poems, a lot of that stuff has never been printed. It's just in her archives. No one's bothered to go and look at it uh, or bothered to make a book out of it at all. Uh, I think there was an anthology of her work 
shortly after her death, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a patch on what she wrote. Uh, but anyway, we're going to read uh, a couple of her poems. Of course, she was she was a, a an orbiting figure, not a central figure, but an orbiting figure of the Harlem Renaissance. So she was interested in a lot of what they were interested in, a lot of what that movement was interested in. The black experience in America, for one, and its changes. It was changing rapidly during this time period where uh, black people were realizing that as bad as things can be in cities, and especially in cities up north, it's better than things are in the south. So let's move. <laughs> let's let's move. Uh, and uh, black people were also doing better despite every obstacle in the world, despite every obstacle that, that bigoted white people could throw in their way. They were doing better. They were owning more businesses. They were succeeding more in business. And this was causing a fundamental, visceral backlash. This is the era of lynchings. This is the, the era of horrific race violence in the South. And that's on the minds of the Harlem Renaissance. But also, what would a Renaissance movement of any kind be without uh, sexual upheaval as well? Uh, and and uh, Angelina Grimke was involved in a lot of that. She was interested in a lot of that. So I want to read you two brief poems of hers. Uh, to start us off on the Harlem Renaissance, I don't, I don't, I haven't looked ahead. I don't remember how many figures from the Harlem Renaissance are actually included in this book. So we might be here for a few Thursdays. We might be in the Harlem Renaissance for the rest of April. Uh, but the first one I want to read is a short. It's a, it's a little ditty uh, called "The Black Finger." It's from 1925, and the second poem I'll read you is from 1927, before the curtain is ready to come down. But they, she's still writing at this period. This is this is the Black Finger. I have just seen a beautiful thing, slim and still against a gold, gold sky, a straight cypress, sensitive, exquisite, a black finger pointing upwards. Why, beautiful, still finger, are you black, and why are you pointing upwards? As you can tell, not formal poetry of any kind, but the poetic sensibility, definitely, is this thing we're going to have to deal with now that we're back to talking about poetry. Thanks to Book Chat with Pat, we're back to talking about poetry, and we're going to have to talk about uh, as the 20th century gains speed and momentum, we're going to have to talk about poetic sensibility versus poetic form, because poetic form is about to get chucked out the window, like last week's garbage. Uh, that doesn't have much in the way. It's an odd. It's an odd. It looks odd. It's got the single words uh, when it narrows its focus, uh, but it's beautiful. I think you'd agree that it's beautiful. Uh, and then we have uh, <clears throat> the next poem is called "A Mona Lisa," not. The Mona Lisa, a uh, Mona Lisa, uh, and uh, well, it's in two parts. <laughs> I'm going to read it to you, and I will do my best to thread our way through this labyrinth. Uh, this is part one. I should like to creep through the long brown grasses that are your lashes. I should like to poise on the very brink of the leaf brown pools that are your shadowed eyes. I should like to cleave without sound their glimmering waters. Their unrippled waters. I should like to sink down and down and deeply down. That's part one. Then part two. Would I be more than a bubble breaking? Or an ever widening circle ceasing at the marge? Would my white bones be the only white bones watering back, wavering back and forth, back and forth in their depths? Ah. Uh. To call this a sensuous poem would be the understatement of the century, and that's just talking about part one. I, I'm not going to be able to help you uh, in this channel, since this is a family channel. I'm not going to be able to help you with what's going on in part two. Read part two yourself. I'm sure this is all in the public domain, so you can call this up on, on you know YouTube or on Project Gutenberg or whatever. You definitely want to read part two, but you also want to look at it. You want to look at what the words in part two are making you see, and if you read it out loud, what they're making your mouth do. This is, this is a very intelligent and I think lovely, absolutely lovely, but also intensely erotic poem. <laughs> I don't know any other way to put that. And uh, to put it mildly, it's not heterosexual eroticism. <laughs> Not at all, especially not that second part. Shall we read it again? I did stumble over one word, so that's a reason enough. Would I be more than a bubble breaking? 
starts right away. I can't explain it on this channel, unfortunately, but it starts right away. Would I be more than a bubble breaking or an ever-widening circle ceasing at the marge? Would my white bones be the only white bones wavering back and forth, back and forth in their depths? Okay, uh, to, to adopt the uh, the forceful naivete that is necessary when talking about this particular kind of poetry, I don't think we're talking anymore about somebody's eyes. <laughs> but, but we're going to leave it be. We're going to leave it be there. This is a poet uh, who definitely fits the tradition of uh, Poetry Thursday that we saw last year, which is something that, that badly needs more study. Where are the biographies? Where are the books? We encountered that many, many times. We're going to encounter that again, although uh, we're going to encounter major exceptions to that rule as well. Uh, but we're going to keep going. Uh, next Thursday, we're just going to keep going with the, the Harlem Renaissance, which uh, even if you don't know much about the Harlem Renaissance, you'll know that it has some big names in it uh, that, we haven't, that we're going to get to. Obviously, this anthology is really good, so it's going to get to all of them. I'll have to figure out how I'm going to do that. Some of them were mighty wordy. <laughs> I don't like these videos to go on forever. But this definitely marks the return of Poetry Thursday. And we're not even straying far from last year. We're doing just this anthology. All the way to the bitter end, we're doing this anthology. So hats off to Book Chat with Pat. I will leave a link to her channel. And I think she did a Poetry Thursday video today. You should go and subscribe. <laughs> it's good stuff. Uh, and uh, I'll be back next Thursday with the next Harlem Renaissance figure. So we'll see each other then. Thank you, Booktube.